Okay, so this afternoon I'm talking about STEM ambassadors. In particular, what they are. Can you put your hand up if you've already heard of the STEM ambassador scheme? Okay, half the room, that's, that's all right. Um, so I'm going to talk primarily about why you would want to become one and use, this sounds very much like this is your life, um, but I want to kind of describe what I've done as a STEM ambassador to try and sort of inspire you to become one. And a lot, um, a lot of the time people are put off from becoming a STEM ambassador because they think, well, what activity would I run? And today we're launching four activities that are being released for the first time today that are available for you to use. Um, so that means that hopefully that barrier has been removed. And then when I've convinced you that you can't possibly not want to become a STEM ambassador, I'll talk you through the process of signing up. So what is a STEM ambassador? Well, to get through the technical jargon, they're volunteers from a wide range of science, technology, engineering and mathematics related jobs and disciplines across the UK. They're people who use their enthusiasm and commitment to encourage young people to enjoy STEM subjects. And they open the doors to a world of opportunity and possibility which come from pursuing STEM subjects and careers. I, I've borrowed these words from the um, STEMnet website, which tells you a bit more about the programme. That's all well and good, but it, it doesn't tell us very much. So as we're statisticians and like some data, let's look at some numbers. So when I was preparing this talk, I found out that there are over 30,000 registered STEM ambassadors in the UK. They're aged between 17 and 70, so age is definitely no barrier. And they come from 2,500 different employers, primarily higher education and industry, but there's a few self-employed people who are STEM ambassadors, there are a few students, and so on and so forth. And I won't give you the whole list, but of ones that I thought were potentially interesting, STEM ambassadors include architects, designers, engineers, farmers, I thought that was quite entertaining, geologists, physicists, statisticians, woohoo, and zoologists, and plenty more in between. So what might you need to do if you're a STEM ambassador? Supporting lessons, potentially, by bringing real world problems for pupils to experience and solve, giving careers talks at helping or helping at careers fairs, providing technical advice to teachers or practical support to STEM projects in and outside the classroom. Now, a classic story that I always tell about this, um, I once had a phone call from a local teacher who said, I, I teach A-level biology and I've, I've seen the new curriculum and I've got to teach something to do with cheese square tests and I've no idea what they are. It, it transpired they were talking about the chi-squared test, but you know, this is the kind of support that we can provide. We also might help schools to make connections with employers and industry resources, so that might be providing mock interviews, talking about what a good CV looks like. And it might involve working with governors to help improve the way STEM is delivered within a school. So there's quite a wide variety of ways that you can be involved as a STEM ambassador. So why would you want to become one? Well, to do the kind of statistical side first, corny though it is, it is about inspiring the next generation. You know, we are statisticians, we do this for a living, but if we don't engage the next generation, there won't be any statisticians of the future. So it's a really important role that we can go into schools and enthuse them. Demonstrate the joy of statistics. Now, this is a really geeky point, but I think if we can talk enthusiastically about our topic and engage two people, four people, 40 people, then we're doing something really good for the society, but also for statistics as a whole. And also, it will help ultimately to develop a statistic, I can never say this, a statistically literate society. So if we manage to get one pupil on board out of a class of, say, 40, but then they go home and tell their parents that they had this cool talk about statistics and they thought it was amazing, and they talk to their parents and their friends, you know, we're all of a sudden um, increasing the awareness of statistics. So it's not just about one person, it's about the bigger picture. From a personal point of view, it certainly increases your confidence. If you can stand in a hall full of 6,000 pupils and get one of them over to your stall to do an activity, job interviews are not quite as intimidating anymore. Similarly, if you can stand in front of a class of year nines and say, today we're going to do maths, you know, this, this certainly helps the confidence. It's great for the CV. It's a really good way of building your CV and differentiating yourself from others. And it's a really useful transferable skill. I hadn't really appreciated this until I put my NIHR fellowship application together. When you get to the plain language summary, 
if you can explain your job to a five-year-old, all of a sudden the plain language summary is a lot less intimidating because you've already tried out on them the word statistics and realised that that's not quite going to work. OK, so to tell you a bit more about my life as a STEM ambassador. So I registered in 2010, and since then I've done 31 different activities. You only need to do one per year to keep up your membership. There's no fee involved, it's just it's called STEM ambassador membership. So in 2013, when I was applying for a postdoc um, and finishing off my PhD, one activity was the max I could handle. In more recent years, I've done uh, more than that, and this year I'm on for nine by the end of the year, I think. And the way that the STEM ambassador network is managed is through local contract holders. And this is a really colourful map of the UK, but I live in Liverpool, um, and so my local STEM contract holder is called All About STEM. So they send me out a newsletter. Um, I think it's about once a fortnight in term time and monthly during the holidays. I look through that, decide if there's anything I fancy. If not, that's fine. If there's something I really like, then I'll sign up and await contact from the school. In the meantime, I'm planning the event. Am I going to a careers fair? Am I going to a science festival? And so on and so forth. And I'll talk a bit more about those in a moment. I try and practice the event. Obviously, it doesn't quite have the same appeal if it's a careers fair. It's a bit difficult to practice standing behind a table. But if I'm going to do a practical activity, then I usually try and rope some people in to be my guinea pigs. And then I go and enjoy the event. I should say at this point that I think I need an extra step. Wait. Teachers are really busy. I'm married to one, so I can confirm this. And therefore, if somebody emails them, it might take them a couple of weeks to get back to you. This doesn't mean that the event isn't going to happen. It just means they haven't had chance. So actually, probably wait some more. But don't be fooled. Um, if you've signed up to do an event, you will be doing it. It's just you might not get the phone call until the night before that says, trust you're all right for 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, so be prepared. And there is plenty of support available. I've put here a photo of the All About STEM team. Um, I know each of them very well, and they know me very well, and we've got a really good working relationship, as they have with many of our STEM ambassadors. So your local contract holder are a really good source of knowledge. Also the Royal Statistical Society, Scott Kerr, who's head of um, statistical literacy and education for the society, is a great contact to have, and he's currently chairing next door's session. If you work for a university, they have excellent contacts too in terms of public engagement officers. And I'm aware that industry and other organisations have similar contacts. <coughs> and also other statisticians who engage with the public. I've got my email address and Twitter handle at the end of my slides. I'm very happy to answer questions people have got, even if it's just to run an idea past me. And many other of the local STEM team are very happy to help as well. So what have I done? Well, I've done 11 careers events. I have to admit they're my favourite. You've got the safety of a table. You know, what can go wrong when you're behind a table? I've done nine A-level support events, four science festivals, two STEM clubs. These are basically extracurricular activities in a local school where you might go in for either a half term or in my case, I went in for an afternoon and that was quite enough for me. Um, I've done two on-site workshops trying to get year 13s to think about studying maths at university and three other, and these are my favourite. I've developed a website for helping pupils think about doing maths at university. I just had to write the bit about maths and stats. I did DNA extraction from a strawberry, and that was amazing fun. Absolutely nothing to do with stats, but the most fun I've ever had in terms of you put a strawberry in a zippy bag, then you gently compress it. Pupils don't get that concept. So you obliterate it and chase it around the room. It's great. Um, and I've also filmed some um, stats activities, and that's to follow. But the reason I put this is because most of those are ones that I found out about because of an email through my local contract holder. The strawberries um, were because somebody in the department said, oh, I've got to do this outreach activity. I need some extra pairs of hands. And I'm like, I'll do it. Um, so you don't have to just rely on emails from your local contract holder. If there's an event you're aware of that you want to participate in, just email your contract holder and say, I'm going to do this event, and that will count in your list of activities for the year. So to give you a bit of an idea about what things might look like, um, this is a photo I've taken of one of the careers events I've been to. So I collect my significance magazines and get those in the department who don't want theirs to recycle them to me when they're done. I've printed off some careers guides from the RSS website. Scott sent me the yellow leaflets, which are all to do with careers in statistics, and I've managed to blag some free um, highlighters to give out. So not particularly difficult, 
but it's a professional looking stall. It's got pictures that people want, in particular the penguins. So people come over and talk to you. And then that's a really good way to initiate the conversation. Oops, press the wrong button. Oh, um, I've um, created some resources for an A-level specific event. So this is to try and get year 12 pupils to think about studying maths at university. And after many, many hours of laminating and cutting, I managed to create sets for the Monty Hall problem that you can see here. So a bit difficult to set up initially, but they now live in the resource cupboard at work. And then my favorite type of activity, the science festival. And I'll talk more about how to always win and how random are you, the activities, in a moment. But the point is, we've got giant inflatable dice. We've got a massive Ludo board. Things to encourage people to come over and speak to us. OK, so my tips would be be comfortable with the material. You don't need to pick something statistically complicated. You know, something simple is great because a year nine pupil will definitely find you out if you don't fully understand what you're talking about. Try and talk to the teacher in advance. With my previous caveat about them replying to emails, it can be difficult. But it is useful to know whether you've got a group of pupils who are mathematically gifted or who find maths really difficult, whether you've got somebody who's got a hearing challenge that you need to make sure you deal with, or what the teacher is trying to get out of the session. Are you supporting the curriculum or are you just there to kind of get them to have a go at statistical activities? Try and make it interactive. So I know I'm standing here talking to you, which is not what we recommend, but you need to try and make it so that you do a bit of talking, then they do something, then you do a bit more talking and they have a go at things. Try and use props. Um, you've seen the photo of the giant inflatable green dice. Although it takes me half an hour to blow up, it's definitely worth it. Because if you can stand there and go, I've got a giant inflatable dice, all sorts of kids will come over, is it a football? And at least then you've got that barrier down. You're able to talk to them from that point onwards. Try and arrange some freebies. Um, we found most successful at Liverpool the tiny mini dice. So you can buy a 1,000 of them for less than a tenner on Amazon. And they're really good because the girls and the boys seem to like these tiny dice, so much so that they tell all their friends who then come over to the store going, is this the store with the tiny dice? And then you can get them to do the activity and, you know, you're hard and fast, I hate maths, still come over because they want the tiny mini dice. And be confident. That's not about walking into somewhere being really cocky, but you do know more about your subject than anybody else does. So be enthusiastic, be engaging, and it's a really good way of running a session. And most of all, enjoy it. It's a real privilege to go into a school and talk about your subject to people who wouldn't normally be exposed to it. They don't get the luxury of going to a conference to hear somebody talk. Um, so, you know, we get that privilege and we should make the most of it. OK, so this is where I kind of need a fanfare. Um, so the RSS Education Committee have been developing a set of activities to help people who do want to go into schools get over that hurdle of, but if I'm there, what do I do? So Simon White from the University of Cambridge, Scott Kerr from the RSS, and myself have developed a set of four activities which are now live on the RSS website, rss.org.uk forward slash hands on. And I checked about an hour ago, and it's definitely live. And each has a two-page written description and a video demo. Don't look too closely for the video demo. They're not arriving till Friday. <coughs> they will be there, I promise. By the time I'm on YouTube, they'll be there. OK, so what are these four activities? Biased sampling, how random are you, how to always win, and stick or switch. Now, I appreciate this is a bit small, but the point is you can all check them on your phone if you want, or you can check them later uh, when you're sat back at your desk. So each is just a simple two-page sheet, and they all follow the same format. So in the top left corner, we've got a, an overall description of the activity. We've then got the learning objectives underneath that. I'll just see if I can not blind somebody. Uh, we've got the list of suggested resources, sort of like a shopping list. Um, how to run the activity. How to extend the activity for those who are really pushing your knowledge of statistics, of, or in fact, um, if you're running this as a classroom activity. The, the workings behind it so that you can describe what's going on and explain the results. The video demo web link, which will be there, and then the risk assessment. So we've set this up such that if you choose to run an activity and the school asks you for more information, you can copy and paste the top bit. Or if they want a risk assessment, you can copy and paste this bit. If you're trying to apply for funding or have got some money to spend, you've already got the shopping list. Everything you need is in one place. 
So to talk you briefly through each activity, this is biased sampling. Now, most of us will be fairly happy with this activity. We've got an assortment of shapes. You can't call them balls in a bag anymore. Counters in a bag. And 20 of them are of one shape, size, and five are of a different. You get the kids to pick out a few at random and to weigh them and so on and so forth. The activity is all about sampling variability, representative samples, bias samples. So nothing particularly demanding statistically, but a really good way to demonstrate it practically. The second activity is how random are you? Now, if you happen to live in Liverpool and say to a pupil, are you random? The response is usually, yeah, I'm well random me. Um, and we can go, ah, but you're not. And we can prove that to them. And it's a really good way of, again, engaging the um, conversation. We, in fact, have t-shirts with how random are you printed on the back, which is a good way, again, of engaging pupils. It's all to do with um, rolling a dice, guessing the number between one and six, um, and comparing the results. And you ultimately find that um, a dice leads to uniform distribution. Human guesses do not. But again, everything you need to run this activity in a two-page document. The third is how to always win, which is my personal favourite because it involves a massive Ludo board. And there's something quite cool about that. Although your knees do object after the first sort of two hours of playing the game. So there's a biased dice and a random dice, or a fair dice, and we get the pupils to try and work out which one's which, use their dice of choice to play the game, and then we talk about a real-life application of why that's useful. In clinical trials, it's to try and get different size groups. If we're going to do some questionnaires, it might be because we want a proportional sample. And then the final activity is called stick or switch. And this is a version of the Monty Hall problem. And all these activities are set up to be five minute wonders, but you can also extend them with, about, with not much, too much statistical knowledge to a whole classroom activity. Um, so this is all to do with goats and cars and whether you should pick the doors or not. OK, so four activities is great, but you're soon going to run out of um, interest in those. So Simon, Scott and I have been working on a new four set of activities, and you get a sneak, pre sneak pe preview even of those in the STEM showcase tomorrow morning at 11.40. And as a sort of hint, we're talking about penguins, playing cards, ducks and bodies. So if you want to know more, I'll see you there. OK, so now I've convinced you that being a STEM ambassador is amazing for statistics as a whole, for your own CV. You only have to do one activity a year, and we've provided the activities. How do you become one? Well, first of all, you go to this website here and sign up. You then need to do what's called a DBS check. It used to be a CRB. It's just checking that you've not got a criminal record or anything that would prevent you from working with children. And then you'll be invited to present your ID documents. And there's a huge array you can pick from, passport, driving license, utility bill, you name it. But your local contract holder will deal with all of that for you. You'll just get an email telling you where to be and when and provide the details. <coughs> then you need to undergo induction training. This didn't exist in my day, and I'm so pleased it now does, because it's quite a big step from sitting on a chair where you are to all of a sudden standing in a classroom going, hello, I'm here. And that induction training will help with that process. And they've now made it so you can either do it in person or you can watch an online video and pick up all the training that way. So when you've done all of that, you just wait for your local contract holder email. You sign up for the event you want. You plan it, remembering the four new activities that have been launched. You practice it, and you enjoy the activity. So that just leaves me to say thank you very much. There are my contact details if you wish to discuss any further. And I'm happy to take questions at the end in the panel. Thank you very much. What I'm going to do to you today is give you a flavour for some of the work that some of the sections and local groups do. And I've got particular thanks to give to uh, the section committees because last week I thought, oh, I've got to prepare for this talk. What do I do? And I emailed each section and asked them each to give me one slide to summarise their activity. So that's what I'm going to try and do today. So let's see if I can work out. Yep. So, so the first thing to say is that sections and local groups are seen as the face of the society. Um, I did a review of the work of sections about two years ago, and we did a survey of RSS members. And a very strong message came back to us that actually we don't go down to RSS offices in Errol Street, we don't get funding to go to conference, but we can go to local groups and we can engage in sections. And actually, that's how we see the RSS. Now, I'm going to 
just check who my audience is. How many of you are in the young statistician section here? Oh, actually, about, only about a quarter, so that's quite interesting. Um, how many of you are in another section? Okay, so that's less than half of the room are engaged in sections, so that's very interesting. So sections and local groups are very important to us, and we continue as a society to work with them to develop what they do and, in a sense, help them uh, do their activities in a more efficient way because they're all volunteers. So my role is as honorary officer and uh, I'm a volunteer as well. So what we have, we have 18 local groups. Have any of you been to a local group meeting? Uh, yes, so there, good coverage there, so about half of you there. So we've got um, local groups all around the UK Apologies to those outside the UK. We know we have a number of members outside the UK. We're always willing to set up local groups in other countries, so do think about that. If you, if you want to do that, I'd be happy to consider that. What you can see here is we have a number across England, uh, three here in Scotland, one in Northern Ireland, and one in Wales. And we're always open to ideas for new local groups. And I have to say these local groups vary in the amount of their activity. So here in Glasgow, the local group is very strong. I think they have 10 activities a year. Some of the others, perhaps down in the south of England, perhaps, I don't know, there are too many in the same location. They're not quite as active as they should be. And if you're in a region where you don't see much activity from your local group, that's a time to approach the organizers or approach me and say, actually, I'd like to be more involved. I've got an idea for what we could be doing. We're always open to that. And so the RSS gives each of these local groups a budget uh, and they organize meetings and do other activities. So for example, we were hearing yesterday that the Sheffield group has been going into schools. So I was just thinking that some of Laura's materials would be great for them, and we should be making sure that we share those materials with local groups as well. But the focus of my talk today is going to be more about the sections and trying to encourage you to get involved in the work of the sections. So sections have been around for, for many years within the RSS, and they really bubble up from the interests of our own members. So members, in a sense, get together in the society, and what they need to do is, first of all, create what we call a special interest group. So that, that's a kind of looser formation of people. They need to bring together people, preferably from across the country, start meeting together, thinking about having um, meetings together, and developing what they could do to further the strategic goals of the society. And there are six goals of the society, which include things like raising public awareness of the issues of statistics, improving statistical literacy and education, uh, in improving membership, issues around public policy, and I've forgotten one, but I'll remember what that is. Um, but all of these things are important. So we're looking for groups of people in areas of statistics that want to help the society with its goals. And, uh, We've got 16 sections. Uh, the ones in bold are new. So within the last year, we've had three new sections. So data science, that thing that everybody's talking about, a new section on that. History of statistics, this was a special interest group and has changed into a full-blown section and international development. And we've got a member of international development here today. And we had something called general application section. And People were never quite sure what that meant, so they've rebadged themselves and they're called emerging applications. Um, so I'm just going to run through um, about 10 of the sections have given me summaries of the, their current activities. And first of all, we start with emerging applications section, which is a bit like a phoenix. It was general applications, but it's, it's emerged as a new section, which is really defining itself as being the section which is at the uh, forefront of activities which are statistical um, activities emerging across a range of industries. So it's not just about academia, which some people used to think about uh, the previous section. It's about 
applications emerging in industry and in government as well. And the idea is that we look at these emerging applications and see if we can share them across industries and create a wider uh, audience. And the kinds of things where we're seeing really exciting emerging applications coming through are obviously in air pollution and health. We've got issues around privacy in statistics, which are important. We've got statistical networks, which covers a whole range of uh, disciplines. We've got modern statistical methods, which are coming through particularly in health and environment. Economic evaluation uh, is something that's coming through not only uh, in uh, evaluation of medicines, which is where I'm familiar with it, but also in infectious diseases. And then looking at issues like reproducibility. And uh, this section is new. It's uh, got together a group of enthusiasts. And they'll be having their first meeting in November with speakers from academia, industry, and government. In terms of data science, the, the thing that's on everybody's lips at the moment, they've uh, created, I think, a, a very ambitious remit, which is here on this slide. So what they're looking to do is to be a professional body that represents data scientists in the UK, because actually data scientists have no home, as it were. And actually the RSS is looking to, in a sense, be the home for data scientists, which is quite uh, ambitious, I think. And you'll see their remits here include promoting good practice, being a trusted voice on data science, um, and in a sense looking to develop the data science community throughout the UK. So literally just been formed, launch event in June, and I think excellent uh, outturn here with 100 attendees at this meeting uh, from a wide range of disciplines. So here, not just in a sense, traditional statisticians. And they are already have a range of activities planned uh, for the future, which include involvement in other people's conferences. So this isn't just about working within the RSS. It's about linking with government conferences. Here, the European Federation of Statisticians in the Pharmaceutical Industry, as well as having events at this conference. Another new section, the history of statistics section. And so some people might say, well, why do we want history? You know, aren't we about numbers? But actually, um, for those of you, have you all been into Errol Street, into the RSS offices? Most people? I think one of the most impressive things about Errol Street is if you look at the, the list of past presidents. And remember that this society is, what, 183 years old. There is a great tradition of statistics, and it's fascinating for us to think about agricultural statistics, economic statistics, official statistics, and to understand how, you know, more than a century ago, how statistics was developed and how it influenced public policy and change in science. And this group actually is really interesting because it's not mainly statisticians, it's mainly people from other disciplines, including historians, who are fascinated to look at the lives of statisticians, but also to, to look at the origin of statistics and to ensure that statistics is used appropriately now. And as we look at fake news, etc., that becomes all the more important. And they've asked me a very specific plea here. They're just developing their committee and they need more statisticians involved. And they particularly love to have some young statisticians involved. Um, so if you would like to uh, join this committee, they would be very interested to hear from you. And if you uh, want that email, I can give it to you at the end as well. But anybody interested in that? Uh, and they've already got their social media uh, sites up already. Uh, so please do think about that if you're interested in that. Medical section, one of our longer standing section, uh, they tend to put on meetings about methodological issues used in medicine, both in the pharmaceutical industry and in health research. Uh, they have subsumed uh, a special uh, interest group they had on primary care, so they cover all forms of medical statistics. They contribute quite high level theoretical papers to discussion meetings, uh, and they've done some joint work with the young statisticians. 
In terms of international development, we have uh, one of the members of that committee here. Um, again, a new section, very exciting. There was a working group that was working on international development. So this isn't about statistics internationally. This is about the very specific issue of international development. So particularly looking, some of you may have heard of the Millennium Goals. Well, these have now been, in a sense, uh, uh, developed and what's the new term for that? It's not the Millennium Goals, it's the SDG, sustainable, development. sustainable Development Goals. Promoting, you know, sort of what do those sustainable development goals mean? How do we measure them? What are the issues of statistics there? How can we contribute to that? So very exciting, I think, this, this section. And um, so they have a role which is about policy and advocacy relating to international development statistics. They want to be a learned society which people can turn to from press and policy perspectives. And they want to encourage professional development in this arena. And they have uh, set up uh, their section, as I said, in uh, July 2016. And they have four main aims. So currently a campaign about the sustainable development goals. They're creating meetings, uh, particularly on uh, multi-dimensional indices of social progress, environment, and economic development. Um, they're looking to link with other partner organizations in particular, and uh, here particularly with the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, and the RSS is supporting particular partnership with that organization. So going from a, a rather new section to one which has been more established, so official statistics. Are any of you working in uh, the official statistics sector? No. So this is often for people working in the Office for National Statistics or here in the Information and Statistics Division, for example, in Scotland. Uh, I've been around for a long time and and as you will know, there have been concern, some concerns about the way official statistics are reported, about the way they're used um, by uh, MPs in particular. And so they've had a function for a long time, which is to provide a forum to discuss some of these quite challenging issues, to bring users and producers of statistics together, and really to support the National Statistics Advisory Group, which sits within the Royal Statistical Society. Um, and uh, their current focus is quite focused on English issues, um, but to look at the Digital Economy Act. There is a new code of practice for official statistics which is being consulted on. And an important role of this section is to work to bring together some consultation activities on that new code of practice, and that's very important work. The, the sports section has been around for uh, a few years. And they look to arrange particularly meetings to discuss issues related to statistics in sport. So there have been issues around cricket, etc. And you've seen some articles written particularly in the Significance magazine. Statistics in, and law, one of the newer sections, just been around for about three or four years. And um, this is a, a quite an interesting section. Again, started after some work within a working group within the RSS, um, and is really partnering with other professions, particularly, obviously, lawyers. And here it's really creating an interface between statistical, legal, and forensic, scientific, and justice communities. So it's really working across all of those communities, and really at a policy level. They've, hold, they've held meetings about a range of topics, but they're actually undertaking uh, work with the RSS that is influencing policy. So they've responded to questions by the forensic science regulator. They've held uh, sessions at other people's conferences. But I think a really interesting thing is they have contributed to a forensic genetics guide, uh, which is developed by lawyers, but now they're really working in partnership with the Law Society to develop a new guide about statistical evidence. Um, and that's really quite an, uh, an exciting initiative, which will be badged badge with the RSS. The statistical computing section uh, tends to uh, have meetings about sort of 
uh, methodological issues related to computational statistics, but also seeks to develop guides about particular areas. The young statisticians section uh, who have welcomed me here today, uh, you will know that they do a wide range of activities. We've seen them all around a conference in their helpful red t-shirts. So they, they help, uh, they're filming things today, they're helping us, uh, they've sponsored. I did write down somewhere, I did write this down. So they've got 13 things, sessions they're doing at conference this year, including the pub quiz, which is tonight? Tonight, yep, yeah. And, and we're all looking forward to the Have I Got Stats For You session uh, after this today. Um, but they also do things like the career days, really, really important. So explaining to young people what kind of careers you can get into as a statistician. And they happen in London, Manchester, and Belfast. Uh, also competitions. So they work with Significance magazine to have the stats excellence for early career writing. Um, and they also link with... Um, other RSS initiatives like getting involved in uh, other societies and uh, in parliamentary events. So that's really important. And I would just say that, you know, there's a lot going on in the sections. I haven't covered some of them, like if you're interested in, in, in environmental or, or quality improvement. The quality improvement section, for example, have also done something really exciting. They have helped develop a new ISO standard and worked with the RSS. So the RSS is now the responsible body in the UK to accredit individuals in Six Sigma and Lean uh, methodologies. And that's all been coming up from sections. So sections do really important work, not just in terms of helping us think about research, but also linking in with professional aspects. So, so whatever your role is, Whatever sector you work in, I would hope that there's a section that is of interest to you. Um, if you can't get to London, that doesn't matter. They uh, do a range of activities, but also the local groups are important as well. So I would say go to the RSS website and get involved to find out what your local group is doing and their events are shown there and also for sections. And if you want any information about any of these and you can't find it on the website, please do email me or get in contact with me. Uh, so hopefully that's given you a, an overview of, of what happens and encourages you to get involved. So thank you very much. Uh, as an Italian, I always felt a bit African. But uh, also, even before starting my PhD, I had the great opportunity of uh, being sent to Malawi for uh, a month and um, it was I mean I didn't travel before that around much the world so it was quite a big step for me going to such a far country but to be honest the first contact with African people was great there, there are people that com convey endless hope and so uh, my first impression was well this is the paradise on earth uh, but actually when I then joined the some of the health workers and went to some of the remotest villages, I could come, uh, I could have a first glimpse of, what, of the harsh uh, African realities where, where every, everything we give from, for granted mm, here in the Western world is a daily struggle uh, instead. So to be honest, that uh, was a, very, a strong motivating factor, especially for my research, which is involved in Africa. Uh, and uh, I, I work, um, uh, at, at the Lancaster Medical School, and my collaborators are mainly epidemiologists. Uh, my interest is in the spatial epidemiology of infectious diseases that mainly affect African communities. So you may be able to understand why teaching in Africa was such an overall choice for me. Uh, but I, I must say that after my experience at Thames, um, teaching in Africa is as challenging as doing research for Africa. And uh, well, before I get to that point, let me just tell you the, what AIMS is. So AIMS is an educational and research institute that has centers uh, across Africa, um, specifically Senegal, uh, Ghana, Cameroon, Tanzania, South Africa, uh, recently Rwanda, um, 
And so AIMS is a, a great opportunity for bright African students, and its aim is to support these talented, uh, um, this uh, talented uh, mind, African minds, to to have a broad overview, I would say, of the modern problems uh, in applied mathematics and uh, and statistics. It is a really it's a unique learning environment for them, but I must say also for the lecturers, uh, especially because they, they come into contact with people from the developed world, and some of them, uh, for some of them, actually most of them, I would say, is the first time where they can have a high quality teaching. And um, so, usually AIMS recruit 40 students from 16 African countries, so this is what happens usually on average, and if you ask and AIM students, why did, did you choose to, to come here? Well, they say, because I wanted to meet other people. Well, this is, this is what, to be honest, I was the answer I got most of the times. So it's about actually meeting people and get to know the lecturers. Uh, so this is just to say that AIMS um, uh, delivers course at master level in statistics. But uh, it's not the, the end point of their career, actually it's the starting point, uh, because it's an opportunity for, for them to explore what they could do after AIMS. And uh, uh, for example, now we have two PhD students uh, at, uh, at Lancaster that are from uh, AIMS. Um, so, I can see it, okay. Um, now it starts to become uh, also a bit personal, but to be honest, I cannot, uh, I cannot tell you what AIMS is uh, if I don't give you also what's my, uh, my view. So that was, the first slide was a bit the official uh, definition of AIMS. And uh, well, if you go to AIMS as a lecturer, you, you, you live next to the students 24 hours a day, and you also eat next to them. So if you are, if you, uh, very jealous of your privacy, you, you will lose it a bit. And uh, it happened to me quite often uh, having students knocking at 10 p.m. asking for clarifications on the assignments. But to be honest, uh, uh, so at the first week that might be a bit of a problem, but then it's actually an advantage, at least from a teaching perspective, because any communicational barrier is then uh, overcome, and also the problems uh, of the class can be identified in a more timely manner. And uh, um, so I, th I would say that the biggest difference between teaching in the UK and teaching at Thames is that at Thames there is a much less focus on summative assessment and uh, there is much more focus on uh, formative assessment. So what's important uh, at AIMS is the activities that the students do to learn um, a statistical idea. It's not uh, very important um, the grade that they get at the end of, uh, of the course, because you will see that um, the, uh, the great opportunity for them is being exposed to these statistical ideas and being able to develop uh, critical thinking about this. I don't know why this slide keep changing. And um, so the, uh, you will be told if you go to AIMS that while you do your teaching, it's important that you avoid rot learning. And uh, this, this, this means that you, you should also be able to interact with, uh, with the students outside the class. So if you go to teach at AIMS, don't think you are going uh, to have a holiday in Africa because it will keep you busy every hour of the day. And so you, if you are an energetic person, then you, you will, be, will be slightly easier for you. Um, okay. So I have also this slide on assessment because um, um, assessment is very important. But as I said, um, it's not the summative assessment we know uh, we are mostly familiar with in the British system. And uh, so you also, you will, I personally spend a lot of time preparing assessments rather than preparing ma uh, teaching material. And uh, this is because um, you will see in the next slides that you, you don't know what the, what the students know before you get to the point of teaching. 
So you don't know how much material you, you will be able to cover. And so that's why assessment is a very important. And it's also important that this continues so that you have, um, you have the big picture of, of the class uh, every, uh, every single day. Uh, that's because um, you, 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 you will see that you will have to, to be very flexible and you will have to adjust the curriculum of your course uh, according to what, the, to what the students ask you and uh, to, to the different pro problems that, um, that will arise. So there are three main forms of assessments. There are uh, assignments that are given three, uh, one every week. A course, I forgot to say, uh, is of a duration of three weeks. So in total, there are three assignments. There are short tests, and um, these vary by lecture and also by the level of understanding of the students. So you may want to do more uh, short tests if you see that the students are not responding very well in class. Um, and you sometimes, at least what I did, is not to consider all of the tests I gave because some of them were, di were disappointing. But um, I, to be honest, blame myself for that and not the students, at least at the beginning. Uh, you also must bear in mind that I, before teaching at Ames, I never taught in the UK. So actually, Ames was for me the first teaching opportunity I've, I've ever had in my life. And then um, in the courses, at the end of a, of a course, three students are selected uh, or more, usually three, four, to give presentations on a specific topic that they work during the course. So the challenge of these presentations is that uh, uh, probably you will give them a topic that you are going to cover in the, in the third week, but these students have to start working on it since the first week. So it's very difficult to understand what you, you can give to them. But uh, what, so, I mean, what impressed me was the hard work that, and the passion that they put in, the, in their study. So I must, be, I, mean, I must say that I was always very impressed also by by the quality of, of, of the work they did in these three weeks. And uh, so my, I, I visited Ames three times. Uh, uh, the first time was in Tanzania, then in Ghana, and then Tanzania again. Um, so some Ames centers has, have started to develop uh, um, some specialties. And Tanzania is the one that has a very strong focus in statistics. Uh, and uh, has also been building uh, a strong partnership with the Royal Statistical Society. Sadly enough, uh, the next year it will, it will not run any course because uh, the Tanzanian go government has not committed to provide funding. Uh, but this doesn't mean that uh, next year it will not be uh, able to run courses, and it doesn't mean that uh, other courses are not doing statistics. But, uh, as you can see, I've been to Ghana. But uh, also another center that uh, uh, has becoming to have a strong statistical focus, uh, and we, uh, where, to be honest, there is a lot of potential there for uh, statistical teaching is Rwanda, which is the most recent uh, uh, center. And uh, well, you, you can teach statistics at any place at times, but uh, uh, Personally, uh, if I had to pick one, I would probably choose Rwanda if, for the simple reason that uh, there is a lot of unexploited potential. And, uh, well, I, I gave, um, when I, in Tanzania, since as I said, they have a, a special focus on statistics, I could be more ambitious. And so I gave a course in just partial methods for public health. Whereas in Ghana, where I have no idea what was going there, I just said, well, let's introduce statistics. But uh, I'll tell you what were my challenges in both cases. I just also want to say that uh, when I was in Tanzania the first time and the second time also, I co-taught with um, Peter Deagle, who is the former president of the Royal Statistical Society. And uh, in, in all of three of my thesis, I had a class of about 25, 30 students. And uh, most of these students uh, uh, were they were from about uh, 14 African countries. But in all of the three uh, occasions, what happened is that the majority were from Nigeria, then uh, a minority uh, from the local uh, place, and uh, then sp sparsed across Africa, to be honest. But you will see Nigerians. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm, 
I just talking about Nigerians, it's because, uh, well, they are the most populous uh, country in Africa, but also you cannot talk about Nigerians in general because you will see, and this is probably not only something related to Nigeria, but to any African country, which is that you, even if you cannot think of a country without taking into account that actually many different people are living there and their culture, their language are very, very different. So actually when I say Nigerian, it doesn't mean uh, anything. Uh, to be honest, uh, except that they come from a specific part. So this is a picture of um, the, f uh, the first year, yeah, yeah two uh, 2016 in Tanzania. So this is Peter Diggle, and uh, th this was the class. Uh, not all of them were attending my course, uh, but about 20, 25. And uh, among them, now I cannot see very well, but there is a current PhD student in Lancaster. So I'm very pleased that uh, we managed to bring him here. Uh, so the challenges, well, there are many. I don't think I cannot cover them in 20 minutes. But uh, the, surely the first time you go there, uh, well, I mean, after I moved to the UK, I spent a lot of time to getting used to the weather. And now I perfectly tuned uh, with the environment. <laughs> but then when you went to Africa, you have to switch back uh, to the heat and, uh, well, uh, Another problem was having a slow internet the first week, so your work is quite slow. Uh, so don't be too ambitious, or oh, you say, oh, in free time I'm going to do some work, because you probably won't be able to do anything. And uh, the heat, to be honest, really sucks all of your energy. So once, well, I, I went to sleep the first week quite early in the evening. Um, so the other big challenge, uh, let's say, of teaching is that there are very, the students have very different educational backgrounds. So you don't really know uh, where to start, to be honest. And the first week is usually explorative. Uh, you, 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 you try to understand what they know, and uh, you adapt. Uh, so, but knowing that, it's always difficult. So when I, especially when I was in Ghana, because at that time I was on my own, uh, and I didn't have the support of the president. But uh, the first week I was going too fast and it didn't uh, emerge until I, I gave the first test where uh, everyone except one failed, yes. Um, but then, you know, you, you talk to them, uh, you also start to be the kind of uh, nice uh, friendship and relationship with the students. Uh, so you, you, you understand very well what their problems are so that you can then uh, fix these problems while you're teaching. Obviously the problem of doing this is that I sometimes, uh, especially because they probably perceived me as their brother, some of them, instead of their lecturer, so I was trying to keep a professional distance with them. And uh, this, this is probably my personal challenge because I, I, I like to communicate with, with the students and uh, I cannot, uh, I mean, I, I, I cannot be too detached. I, I cannot think of them as people, not only as students. There are also some linguistic barriers because uh, some of the students will, will, will be coming from uh, speaking, uh, English speaking countries, but others from French speaking or Arab speaking countries, and their English is not, uh, uh, well, they, they, have, they struggle. To, to speak sometimes because they are shy and they don't want to, um, you know, to, to show their deficient, deficiency in English. But uh, despite that, uh, um, uh, some of those people also managed to get the highest grades. So it, it was not an impediment for them. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it was great to see that. And uh, every time I was at Ames, they, they also ran English courses because they are aware of these facts. Um, so you, it's something to take into account also when you are teaching. Uh, this is another thing, I'll be very quick. Uh, so after I had my first experience, I honestly thought I needed some training in teaching. Uh, and uh, for this reason, I, went, I did the postgraduate certificate of, in academic practice. And this is, um, this is a master level course in uh, teaching that is usually delivered by any British uh, university. And I would strongly recommend that if you are at the start of your lecturing career, because uh, it really helped me to focus on the 
teaching problems and principles that I have to account for when, when I'm in a class. And one of the first, to be honest, the, the most important thing I've learned uh, is that you need to have feedback when you're teaching and uh, external feedback can really help you. Uh, so, in, in, at Thames, there are different ways uh, you can achieve that. There are tutors that will always follow you during the course and they will give you feedback after every lecture. And uh, when I was, uh, well, when I was obviously in Tanzania, I had uh, the president who gave me always uh, timely feedback, but also uh, when I was in Ghana, what I did is to record this, um, some of my lectures and then I sent I send them to my to some of my colleagues uh, in Lancaster and to be honest uh, the I mean it's very important to have an outside perspective uh, of your teaching because there are always things you you don't see because you you always see from things from your angle so how you can get involved well there are three main uh, three main ways you can get involved I I was a lecturer because that's what I wanted to do, I wanted to be there for three weeks. Eh? But if you want to stay longer, you can be a names tutor. So if you are a names tutor, you will work uh, with the academic director uh, to um, help the students during their course uh, understanding what, what has been taught in class. You will also correct many assignments. Um, and to be honest, uh, they were really one of the most important people I had in class that, and that really helped me with my teaching. And I, I don't think that without tutors, I could give good teaching. Um, but then I also was a supervisor. So after teaching at Ames, I supervised, uh, now, I, well, in total, after my three experiences, I supervised six students in uh, different projects. And it's a really rewarding experience, especially uh, because you see how, I mean, how passionate they are about the, the the subject you taught, and also the high quality of, uh, of the work. Um, obviously, it's, uh, I mean, it's not, uh, it's demanding because I had Skype calls every week, but then you also, I mean, if you want to be a, a good supervisor, at least what I think you should do is also read their material and uh, provide feedback or um, show them how to do some things uh, in R or also the whiteboard through the screen. And uh, so it's, it's time consuming, not too much, but be aware that uh, you need to allocate time for this. So these are some links uh, of where you can get more information. So an overview uh, is found at this link of uh, all the AIMS activities and centers. Then there are also some links for uh, every single center where you also fi find local news. There is also an RSS link where uh, also the partnership between RSS and AIMS is further explained. And then there are also two links that I found about uh, people describing their experiences as tutors. So I gave mine as lecturer. Thank you very much.